Um, today's session obviously was uh, things vascular, uh, which I'm sure you can tell from looking at the slides. And again, that was a suggestion uh, from from the attendees. And so, if you have any other differentials that you would like to have covered, please be sure to shoot us an email uh, at sages uh, at education at sagesdx.com. And if you have any questions about um, today's session, you can either uh, send them to the education email, or you can email me directly at uh, tdavis at sagesdx.com. Uh, you can always text me or call me to my cell phone is 210-416-4815. I know there are some third year residents who uh, have graduated, and there may be some first year residents who are tuning in for the first time. Uh, if you'd like to be included uh, on our uh, invitation list, especially if your email has changed, please go ahead and send that in to um, uh, education at sagesdx.com, or you can log on to our website, sagesdx.com slash education, and uh, leave your information there, and we'll make sure that you get added uh, to the list. So let me go ahead and share my screen and we'll get started with uh, today's session. Let's see, here we go. Okay, so again, uh, today's sessions, things vascular. Let me go ahead and back out here. That's slide two. Let's go ahead and go back to slide one. Okay, slide one, we have a scoop shave. This is from the neck, and uh, one can see a high concentration of sebaceous glands here. The surface is a little papillated, and frequently near flexural uh, surfaces, you do see a little bit of uh, papillomatosis of the um, And we have a dome-shaped papule here. And I think what's uh, distinctive about this proliferation, even at low power, is it's got a distinctive lobular architecture. So we've got these more cellular areas. Go ahead and draw a couple of these uh, that are separated from one another by these fibrous septi. Uh, also of note, uh, in addition to the lobular architecture of this lesion, is the presence of a, what we call a collarette of epithelium at the base of the specimen. So we've got a proliferation of epidermal and adnexal keratinocytes that are kind of growing in and trying to kind of wall off uh, this particular prol proliferation at its base. So let me go ahead and, and um, clear my diagrams there. If we go in and look at the more cellular areas, what we begin to see is that we've got a lot of dilated uh, vascular channels. These are small capillary sized vessels, and they're lined by very uniform Latin endothelial cells. Most of them do contain red blood cells. Some contain more uh, erythrocytes than others. And then between uh, the vessels, we have a number of kind of compressed or packed endothelial cells. And this uh, appearance, the architecture, the cytology, is diagnostic of a lobular capillary hemangioma, uh, also known as, of course, a hygienic granuloma. Some people even refer to this lesion as a hemangioma of granulation tissue. Now, I think one entity that uh, enters into the differential here uh, is a capillary hemangioma, or cherry hemangioma, which is another type of capillary hemangioma. With a cherry angioma, uh, it tends to lack the lobular configuration, so you don't have the fibrous septi uh, transecting or dividing up the uh, vascular proliferation, number one. Number two, it has more ectatic vessels and fewer, fewer cellular areas, so you don't get these packed into the eel cells in a cherry hemangioma. Uh, and one clue that uh, one of my mentors taught me very early uh, in my uh, derm path fellowship is that a pyogenic granuloma on scan a lot of times looks kind of blue. And it tends to look blue because 
you've got a lot of compressed endothelial cells between the vascular spaces. The cherry angioma on scan tends to look more red, and that's because you're seeing the ectatic vessels filled with RBCs and fewer compressed endothelial cells. So kind of a, a, a good clue, good tinctorial clue. Uh, vascular proliferation with a benign configuration, lobular blue, think pyogenic. If it's more red, uh, a little less cellular, think cherry angioma. They're both capillary hemangiomas, so um, you know, so the distinction is not that critical. Um, and I, I will add that the first three sections, the first three slides that we're going to look at, slide one, slide two, or case two, or case three, they all have similar architectural configuration, which is why I put them uh, in the particular order that I did. So let's go ahead and look at the next case. Uh, let me flip the slide here. This is uh, a kind of a bread loafed scoop shave. And, and you can see this lesion has some architectural uh, similarity to the first case. We've got kind of a dome-shaped papule here. It's a little hard to get the bearings, but one gets the idea that there's a colorette of epithelium kind of at the base of the specimen. This is a dome-shaped, it's ulcerated, unlike the pyogenic granuloma that we looked at. So if we go in and, and look at the surface, we can see the epidermis is absent. There's a little bit of fibrin and some neutrophils on the surface. Uh, at a first blush, it does bear some similarity to the uh, pyogenic granuloma. Clearly, in the dermis, this lesion is more cellular than the pyogenic. Uh, there's a little bit of edematous tissue, uh, maybe granulation tissue, beneath the ulceration, but it lacks the lobular configuration that we saw with the pyogenic. So it's, it's not being divided into distinct lobules by the fibrous tissue. Furthermore, uh, as we zoom in uh, on higher power, and especially as we begin to look at the more cellular areas, what we begin to see is parallel fascicles of spindled cells. Now, some are cut longitudinally, some are cut cross section. But unlike the pyogenic granuloma, the predominant cell type in the cellular uh, areas is a spindled cell. And there's some nuclear pleomorphism here. These, these cells are, the nuclei of these cells are a little variable in size and shape. Furthermore, if you, if you begin to look at higher power, you begin to see mitotic figures uh, in many foci. Up here is one, another one right here, and a few apoptotic cells. And then a key feature to note with this particular tumor is the presence of individual erythrocytes located in the spaces between these spindled cells. And you can see that in many, many areas. You can pick out individual erythrocytes in the spaces between these fascicles of spindled cells. And this is virtually diagnostic of nodular Kaposi sarcoma. Of course, an HHV8 stain uh, would uh, demonstrate striking nuclear decoration of many of the neoplastic cells. But a point we've made in the happy hour sessions before and in some of our board reviews, the HHV stain is a little, uh, it, it, it's not always a real strong stain. So sometimes, even in the setting of Ford Kaposi's, only 10 to 20 percent of the spindle cells will show decoration. And so you've really got to go down on high power. This is an immunostain thing that's not going to always blow you out of the water. And you have to go down on high power and look for, for the uh, stain pattern. Another point that I'd like to make is, you know, we clearly have uh, cells of Kaposi standing here in the dermis. But if we look near the surface of the specimen, and I'm going to demarcate it here with the arrow, Beneath the ulceration or eroded epidermis, we have granulation tissue. And this granulation tissue is essentially uh, similar to what you see in a pyogenic granuloma. And so if you uh, are suspecting Kaposi's sarcoma, make sure you do a nice deep biopsy. 
Because if the biopsy is too superficial, you may just get the granulation tissue and the diagnostic changes of Kaposi sarcoma may lie deep to the session, to the uh, section. So make sure when you're looking at vascular tumors, if you see granulation tissue on the top, carefully study uh, the deeper portions to make sure that you don't have either Kaposi sarcoma or melanoma or angiosar down deeper. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide three. I'm going to flip the slide here. And slide three also has quite a bit of similarity to the other two slides in that we've got a dome-shaped kind of bloody papule here. And you can see a lot of extravasator red blood cells. Once again, like the second case, the Kaposi's, this particular proliferation does not have a lobular configuration. So we don't see the, the fibrous septing uh, transecting uh, the cellular areas like we do in a pyogenic granuloma. The epidermis is kind of bent here. The surface of the specimen is focally eroded. We clearly have a lot of extravasated red blood cells and uh, some cellular areas here. And if we move into higher power, we can see some vascular channels. But uh, moving into higher power still, you can see that a lot of the vascular uh, lumina are around. And rather than having flattened endothelial cells, the endothelial cells in this case are more plump. They're not spindled. These are definitely more epithelioid, round to oval nuclei, and a moderate amount of pale staining cytoplasm. And uh, some of the lumina of the cells are a little compressed, but the endothelial cells or the cells comprising this proliferation definitely have an epithelial appearance. Uh, there's an associated infiltrate of inflammatory cells within the stroma. We have some lymphocytes, and if, in a few areas, there were some neutrophils. But the distinctive and characteristic feature of this lesion. Uh, and the diagnosis rests upon recognition of these amphiphilic amorphous purple deposits throughout the stroma uh, of this tumor. And what these are, are large uh, collections of gram-negative coxobacilli. These are uh, two, this condition tends to be caused by two closely related Bartonella species, and this is bacillary angiomatosis. And bacillary angiomatosis does bear some similarity at blush to, to nodular capsules or a pyogenic, but again, the uh, uh, lesion the, is characterized by the presence of epithelioid uh, appearing endothelial cells, uh, the presence of these amorphous uh, deposits which again are the coxobacilli, and then a lot of times scattered throughout the lesion, you will see a mixed inflammatory infiltrate. For all, you see a lot of neutrophils more uh, generally than are present in this particular biopsy specimen. We don't see too many biopsies of uh, bacillary angiomatosis anymore uh, with uh, better uh, HIV therapy, retroviral therapy therapy instance, I think, is kind of decreased. And a lot of times the diagnosis is made clinically and the patients are put on erythromycin. But there was a time when we'd see a lot of biopsies of bacillary angiomatosis. You can highlight the organisms, uh, these, these masses of organisms in the, in the purplish areas with a silver stain. So they'll stain with the GMS or a Steiner or uh, a Warthen Starry. You can also use an IHC stain to identify the organisms. So, bacillary angiomatosis, I mean, uh, bacillary angiomatosis tends to be associated with immunodeficiency. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide four. Slide four is an entity we've discussed in happy hours before. This is a bisected punch biopsy from the trunk, and uh, one can see a cellular infiltrate within the dermis. Uh, in the mid-reticular dermis, it looks kind of nodular, very solidly cellular. But if we look at the surface of the specimen uh, in the upper half near the papillary and upper reticular dermis, 
we do see some spaces here, some dilated spaces. And uh, moving to higher power, we can see that these really are kind of crack-like vascular spaces. And if we move to higher power still, we can see that many of these are lined by very hyperchromatic, kind of very plump and somewhat pleomorphic, atypical endothelial cells. And these crack-like vascular spaces, uh, some of them are vertically oriented, some of them are horizontally oriented, but they dissect between the collagen bundles. And if we look at the more solid areas, we can see that the, the cells have a more epithelioid appearance, but they're uh, clearly pleomorphic, the nuclei, hyperchromatic, there were a few abnormal mitotic figures. And you can see even in these more solidly, solid areas, this tumor is vasoformative. It's trying to form these channels, many of which contain red blood cells. And this uh, picture is very uh, characteristic of an angiosarcoma. This was an angiosarcoma that had developed in uh, a post-radiation site, the woman that had breast cancer, got radiation therapy and developed an angiosarcoma. Uh, in that site. But whether the angiosarcoma occurs on the trunk or on the head and neck, the histology is, is uh, very similar. And of course, the, the diagnosis can be confirmed uh, by staining with a vascular marker. Uh, a lot of times we'll use two or three vascular markers to confirm the diagnosis. The three that we use most often are CD31, CD34, and ERG. And at times the uh, uh, CD31 or CD34 stain can be negative in uh, more epithelioid angiosarcomas. And sometimes the epithelioid angiosarcomas can even express a uh, cytokeratin. So uh, you, the presence of these crack-like vascular spaces, some of them have been, been described as lightning strike-like. Uh, and the presence of plump hyperchromatic endothelial cells are what distinguish angiosarcoma from Kaposi sarcoma, much more atypy of the endothelial cells generally in angiosarcoma than in Kaposi sarcoma. And in Kaposi sarcoma, you know, in the, it, like we pointed out in the more nodular Kaposi's, you're going to see the fascicles of spindled cells with the erythrocytes between the spindled cells. We don't have any of that here. In plaque, or uh, patch stage capacities, you can see uh, dilated vessels more readily, but a lot of times capacities will begin around pre-existing vascular spaces, and the channels are gonna be more horizontally oriented than the uh, vertically oriented uh, channels that you see in, in angiosarcoma. So I'll play that, will help you distinguish the two of them. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide five. Slide five, let me see if I can rotate the slide a little. Uh, we have uh, a, a large punch biopsy. Uh, let me get it. This is from the trunk or proximal extremity. It's been trisected. And within the deeper reticular dermis, extending into the subcutaneous tissue, we have a very uh, well circumscribed uh, neoplasm with a uh, benign silhouette here, uh, in that particularly infiltrative pattern. Let me clear that mark. And uh, one can see several widely dilated uh, vessels or vascular structures within this uh, particular neoplasm. Let me reload the slide. It's not letting me, sorry about that, it's not letting me focus in on it. Uh, we can see several widely dilated. Uh, vascular channels that are filled with erythrocytes. Uh, these vascular channels, we'll zoom in on these. You can see that they're lined by flattened, normal appearing uniform endothelial cells. But what's distinctive about this tumor uh, is, or this particular proliferation, uh, is that we have these uh, kind of parallel rows of cells with very uniform round to oval dark staining nuclei and a moderate amount of uh, pale to pink staining cytoplasm. 
very monotonous proliferation of cells that uh, are located at the periphery of these dilated vascular channels. Uh, these cells, if you put an immunohistochemical chemical stain for smooth muscle actin on them, would uh, light up very, very strongly, not so much with Desmond, but with smooth muscle actin. And that's because they're modified smooth muscle cells. This, of course, is a glomus uh, tumor. And I think about the only thing that you might confuse this tumor with, uh, given the monotonous appearance of uh, the glomus cells, is perhaps uh, a, 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 an anexal tumor showing uh, acrosyringeal differentiation, one of the poroid neoplasms, because those also are extremely uniform. However, those do not locate at the periphery of vessels. And they're uh, characterized by the presence of ductal structures. I point that out because occasionally you will uh, encounter a glomus tumor in which you've got a preponderance of the glomus cells, these modified smooth muscle cells, and the vascular lumina may not be super obvious or the glomus cells may have compressed the lumina. And so the, the vascular nature of the tumor may not be quite as obvious. But uh, if this were a poroid neoplasm, one would have to see ductal elements, and you're not going to see ducts uh, in a glomus tumor. So keep in mind that uh, some glomus tumors are more vascular than others, but a very distinctive uh, tumor. And again, SMA is positive, and these are, are modified smooth muscle cells. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide number six. Slide number six is a uh, trisected shape biopsy. I think we've covered this uh, before in, um, in a previous happy hour, but since we're doing vasculars, we want to make sure that we include this. We have a dome-shaped papule, and one can see uh, within the dermis kind of these scattered uh, cellular areas. And uh, there appear to be some kind of crescenteric shaped dilated spaces here. Uh, let me go ahead and clear my mark. And if we move to higher power again, I'm gonna have to reload the slide here. Sorry about that. Let me rotate it a little bit. If we look at these spaces, we can see that these uh, spaces are lined by uniform endothelial cells. But a closer examination of this proliferation really reveals that what we've got in the solidly cellular areas are capillary loops. And these capillary loops are actually present within a dilated vascular space. And looking at the capillary loops at higher power, what we begin to see are sequestered, degenerated red blood cells uh, in this area. Let me see if I can find a few more of them. Here's some more here. You can see that the red blood cells are fragmented here, and they're, they're kind of sequestered within the capillary loops. And the presence of these capillary loops within a vessel and the sequestered uh, red blood cells are diagnostic of a glomeruloid hemangioma. And of course, glomeruloid hemangiomas have been associated with both the Pohn syndrome uh, and also Castleman syndrome. Now, not everybody who has a glomeruloid hemangioma will have one of these syndromes, but if you do see a biopsy of a glomeruloid hemangioma, the patient needs to be evaluated for one of those. So again, these, these capillary loops within a dilated vascular space really resemble the glomerulus, and you'd have to go back to, to med school and look at some kidney biopsies, but these really do look like glomeruloid. A glomeruli. And again, make sure you look for the presence of the sequestered degenerated red blood cells uh, within the uh, central areas. Now, a tumor which causes some confusion, I found among residents with this particular uh, lesion, is our, our next case. And this is an incisional biopsy. This was from the uh, trunk of a, a three or four year old. And you can see throughout the dermis these large kind of cannonball collections of uh, capillary sized vessels. And at the periphery of many of these, you can see 
uh, let me pan here. Again, these crescenteric vessels, they're at the periphery of these large nodules or cannonball-like collections of capillaries within the dermis. But these are not one, lying within a vascular structure, and two, we don't have the sequestered red blood cells uh, degenerated that are characteristic of a glomerular hemangioma. So this is a tufted angioma, also known as an angioblastoma. And again, note that these large nodules or cannonball-like collections of capillaries throughout the dermis. And this uh, is an important lesion to recognize because uh, some kids with this condition uh, are, are, can develop the Casamoc merit syndrome with a conceptive coagulopathy. So uh, angioblastoma or um, tufted angioma, very characteristic appearance. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide eight. Slide eight was a, a little bit of a tougher case. This is a lesion which has only been recognized and described in the last 20 or so years. A very, very subtle, we have a, um, uh, one, two, three, four, five, a broad shape, which was cut into five pieces here. It's from sun damaged skin. Uh, this was from the arm. And uh, very, very subtle. And it's only as we move into higher power that we begin to note uh, within the upper portions of the reticular dermis a proliferation of capillary sized vessels that are lined by very, very uniform endothelial cells. And if you move a little out and look uh, at across the biopsy specimen, you can see that uh, you've got this proliferation of capillary vessels, kind of nondescript, very uniform, but arranged in kind of a, a parallel plate-like fashion across the, the biopsy specimen, all in concert with striking solar elastosis. And this is uh, what is known as an acquired elastotic hemangioma. And I know I saw this before the condition was described. It was described by Dr. Rakenia and uh, uh, co-workers out of Spain in an article in the JF in the early 2000s. And, and it's a not uncommon uh, proliferation. Usually occurs on the uh, arms or on the neck of uh, mainly middle-aged females, although it has been reported in males. And presents usually as kind of a bluish or purplish area. A lot of times it doesn't even come in as a mangioma, uh, but uh, very distinctive appearance. They all look like this. You get this uh, embedded within this intense zone of solar elastosis, uh, this kind of parallel proliferation of capillaries, uh, parallel to the DEJ that is. Uh, within the upper reticular domes. So acquired elastonic hemangioma. I think we've got a little bit of time. Let me go ahead and open the, the chat here if I can see if I have any questions at this point in time. For some reason, it's not opening up. Well, if you have any questions, just go ahead and send them to the, uh, to the email. Okay, our next case is a, a trisected shade biopsy. We've got a dome-shaped papule and slightly eroded. This particular lesion has uh, the appearance of uh, the first three lesions, I think, that we saw. And here you can see uh, this particular lesion, like the pyogenic, has a, a somewhat lobular configuration. So we have uh, these uh, zones of fibrous tissue uh, kind of transecting the uh, proliferation into lobules. Here though, if you, if you look at the central portion of uh, some of these lobules, you can see that we've got centrally located thick walled vessels that are lined not by flattened epithelial, endothelial cells, but these, these kind of hobnailed or plump epithelioid cells that protrude into the lumina. And, you know, to note here, one thing to note is that these are not particularly hyperchromatic. Uh, they're a little pleomorphic, but they're no mitotic figures. And uh, here's another vessel here with kind of these plump 
uh, epithelioid endothelial cells, whereas the vessels out at the periphery have more typical flattened endothelial cells. And accompanying this change is a moderately dense infiltrate that contains lymphocytes and numerous eosinophils. And this is an example of angiolymphoid hyperplasia with eosinophilia. It's been lumped under the rubric of histiocytoid or epithelioid hemangioma as well. And typically, uh, it does have a lobular configuration with centrally located thick walled vessels lined by these plump epithelioid cells. Uh, at the periphery, smaller vessels and a variably dense infiltrate of lymphocytes and eosinophils. sometimes the inflammatory infiltrate, but the histologic hallmarks are these thick walled vessels with plump endothelial cells. Uh, keep in mind that the, the uh, density of the uh, lymphocytes and eosinophils can be somewhat variable in lesions of ALH. You typically present as multiple papules on or around the head or neck. Okay, let's go ahead and move on to slide 10. We have a dome-shaped bisected papule here. Um, actually has the architectural configuration somewhat of a separated keratosis. It's a little bit of hyperkeratosis, it's a little bit papillomatous, kind of looks like a bloody cell. Uh, but as we move down to higher power, we see just beneath the dermal epidermal junction, we've got very dilated vessels lined in areas by flattened endothelial cells and containing numerous uh, erythrocytes. Some of the vessels are more congested than others. Uh, again, you can see in areas, flattened endothelial cells. Some of these vessels are partially thrombosed and filled with fibrin thrombi, and the epidermis is hyperplastic. And this is an angiokeratoma, a very characteristic uh, histologic appearance. Slide 11 is a tumor which bears uh, striking proliferation, uh, or should striking uh, similarity rather, sorry about that, to uh, an angiokeratoma. And again, once again, we have hyperkeratosis, papillomatosis, epidermal hyperplasia. Looks a little uh, like a separate keratosis. This is a kind of a poorly stained section. My apologies for that. As we move to higher power, though, once again, we've got these dilated vascular spaces. These two are aligned by flattened endothelial cells, but rather than containing numerous RBCs, we've got lymph fluid here, this, this kind of amorphous, wispy material. Sometimes one can even see little valvular structures, uh, and this is a lymph angioma, which of course clinically will look a little more like frog, frog spawn, a little more um, pinkish in color than, than red. And sometimes you can see a few extravasated red blood cells in a lymph angioma. Here we've got mainly lymphocytes, however. So lymph angioma bears some similarity to the hemangioma. These will stain, the, the lymphatic endothelium will stain with D240 uh, as opposed to the, to the angiokeratoma, which would stain with CD31 or CD34 or ERG. And then rounding out our uh, dozen vascular tumors. We have case 12. And case 12 also was a little bit tough. This is a uh, unevenly sectioned or bisected punch biopsy from the trunk. And about the only thing I think you can say at scanning magnification is there's a, there's a cellular infiltrate uh, within the upper portion of the reticular dermis here. And, uh, you know, it's hard to tell whether this is even neoplastic or inflammatory. Uh, it does appear to extend in this uh, piece on the left to the peripheral edges and base of the specimen. We have to really kind of zoom in on higher power to see kind of what's going on here. And if, if you do, what you begin to notice is that this is actually a vascular proliferation. We have kind of these elongated, very uh, uh, elongated vascular spaces that are lined by uniform endothelial cells, but they've kind of got compressed lumina, and many of them are collapsed, and they're present really throughout the dermis. 
uh, like I said, in this, in this particular piece, they extend to the, to the base and to the edge, but there's no significant atypia uh, of the uh, endothelial cells, and they're lined, like I said, in a very continuous fashion uh, by uh, these endothelial cells. And this is a very characteristic appearance for a microvenular uh, hemangioma. The name, I think, describes the tumor. And these have also been reported rarely uh, in, uh, in patients with, uh, with Castleman syndrome. So uh, uh, anyway, this kind of concludes our uh, discussion of um, vascular tumors. Hope you guys found it helpful. And again, if you have any questions at all, please uh, feel free to uh, submit them to the, to the Sages website or contact me directly. And uh, next week, Dr. Lee is going to be running our uh, session, and he'll be covering fibrous tumors. And uh, the slides for that should go out within the next day or so. I hope you enjoyed the session, and I hope everybody has a very nice evening. Thank you.